Hi, Stuart here with a creator commentary on the making of Lettuce Contains a Lot of Protein and Carbs. So I'll be talking over the video here, playing and pausing and explaining some of the process behind the scenes and how this video was created. This is lettuce. There's not so much to it. So after the video Carbon-Based Life Forms, I had the idea pretty much straight away to talk about the different macromolecules in the context of food. How everything you eat has all macromolecules in it, even something that basically seems just like water and fiber. Protein and carbs? So I'll just pause here. So the genesis of this video and the script for it, I wrote way back in summer 2019. And I've basically been working on this video off and on for the last two years, essentially. Mostly off, sometimes on. But just to give you a little bit of behind the scenes, I recorded this little intro bit. Here, I'll play some of it. This is lettuce. There's not much to it, is there? It's mostly water. Why am I breathing so hard? You're mostly water. <sighs> me. In the last video we talked about how... Talking into my phone. Despite being mostly water, the important molecules... Okay, well, let's skip ahead. So here we're going to look at whether... <laughs> Lettuce has protein in it. So or something like that. Protein was the original idea. Have have a piece of lettuce in a light box and poke it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's basically what uh, what I did. There's a piece of lettuce. This is lettuce. And I poked it. There's not it. much to it, is there? Okay, so the reason I was I was breathing hard, I'm pretty sure I just was exercising. And that brings up a good point that when I'm exercising or like having a shower or something like that, those are good times to come up with good ideas. But the problem is then you have to like figure out a way to document those while the ideas are still fresh and I'll lose them right away. So I do lose a lot of ideas um, because I'll have this long meandering stream of consciousness thought process. And then afterwards when I'm like, what was I really trying to say? Because I'll think of the wording of the language that I want to use, so anyways. It's mostly water. You're mostly water. Are you mostly lettuce? So this here, this, I mean, this is a, just a visual gag is a little bit of part of the hook in the video. Um, but I wanted to, to do it justice to make it like an actual visual gag. So from the previous video, the carbon-based life form one, if you haven't seen it, this, this thinker sculpture was a visual meta metaphor for what humans are made of. So I filled it with atoms, I filled it with water, uh, like we just saw, and filled it with carbon. So here I'm filling it with lettuce. And in making this, I thought I was going to have to do something really complicated by simulating the lettuce here as like kind of cloth, cloth simulations, have it fall down inside the statue in this hollow statue and get it all smunched up in the legs here. And it sounded like a nightmare. Turns out I, I was just able to scatter points inside the volume inside the, the statue and copy randomly oriented pieces of lettuce, basically little flat cards and chopped off the bits where they were sticking out the outside and rendered it. So all the lettuce is just flat planes that are intersecting with each other. But the thing is, you don't really see that. It actually looked kind of convincing as a bunch of lettuce. So job done there. No, that's not how that works. Aside from water, did you know that lettuce is crammed full of protein and carbs? Mm -hmm. Really? Yes. Yes. Maybe. Let's, Let's find, find out. out. Okay, so that was my attempt at visual humor. I wanted to zoom into the lettuce to find out what's inside it, but I just grabbed the tripod and pushed it up the pushed the camera towards the lettuce. So it makes me laugh even if nobody else does. That's fine. All right, let's skip ahead. But when they're tightly stuck together with these bonds... So this is one of the hardest parts of the storytelling process for me. Um, if somebody is coming to the video with very little biochemistry or biology knowledge, I want them to be able to follow the video. So ideally they would watch another video where I introduce a topic more fully, like in this example, um, the carbon-based life form video. But I can't assume that everybody will do that. So somehow I need to get people up to speed relatively quickly so that they can follow the we contents 
um, in the current video, but without being condescending or going too fast. And so going back here, I also think it's pretty common for people to get confused between what an atom is, what a molecule is, a picture of an atom, a picture of a molecule. I really wanted to hammer that home because that's a really key foundational concept. And for people who don't have what some people call visual literacy, the idea that you, when you can look at an image of something and you have an, an intuition of what that kind of science concept is being shown in the image, like continuing to, to get people more familiar with those ideas. Um, that's important. So yeah, this is ATP to be discussed. I, I, I do want to do a video about ATP. I don't know when that'll happen, hopefully within the next year, but who knows? We'll see. No promises. Let's skip variations ahead here. in macromolecules. Yeah, so I managed to cram an introduction to phylogenetic trees into this video. Look at me go. This is by far the densest video that I've ever made in terms of concepts and like number of ideas introduced. But I also don't think that it, well, I hope it doesn't overwhelm. At least you can watch it and glean some of the most important bits and not feel totally lost. And I also feel like it hangs together as a cohesive whole despite having so many different things in it. So that's something that I'm, I, I feel pretty proud about. The video, from my perspective, does a pretty good job of being a cohesive whole while also like kind of a fire hose of information if you really want to dig into it and watch it multiple times. I don't know if anybody <laughs> caught the um, Spider-Man pointing meme. Uh, <laughs> again, I put some jokes in for myself as much as anybody else. Whatever. Relatives. They probably look pretty complex, right? Let's break it down. No, not, not into individual atoms. So I think this is a pretty cool shot. It wasn't too complicated to simulate. Rigid body destruction is pretty commonplace in computer simulation. So yeah, there's a lot of Just people like doing small molecules pretty similar atoms. things. And this was a funny early test of me trying to get that breakdown working. So there's the phospholipid that's like sagging, but not falling apart. And then it just goes crazy. Who knows why? But I got it working. Macromolecule. I do think this kind of reassembly is, is kind of a nice touch. It's pretty cool. It's all, it's all one continuous simulation. Not, not into individual atoms. But actually the thing I'm most proud about in this shot is actually the Foley. I bet you didn't think about it too hard, but no, not, not I mean, obviously computer simulations don't produce audio like by default. So I generated the sound by, are made of small molecules. I generated the sound by using plastic beads and that's definitely the best Foley work I've done, at least in my opinion. No, not, not into individual atoms. Just like small molecules are made of atoms, macromolecules are made of small molecules. If you wanted to build something complex, you could... So I really wanted to put, um, for this little Lego animation, I wanted to put the Lego logo on each of the studs as it is in real life. It's a little nice little touch for added realism, but the, it wasn't because it was too complicated, too hard to render. Um, I just didn't want to have that potential copyright infringement. Lego would never come after me, but you know. So this is not Lego. These are generic interlocking plastic bricks. Use the smallest construction units available. These building blocks. Okay, so here we get into the whole world of together to make assembly and disassembly. Macromolecule. So there's a couple main ways to do this kind of simulated things coming together and things coming apart. This comes up over and over in this animation. We have molecules getting assembled and mole molecules getting broken down. Molecules breaking down is pretty straightforward because you can have your structure where it's all together, create that however you want. Let's say it's a protein, you can get a protein structure. And then to break it down, you treat each of the individual components that you want, treat it as a separate piece, and then tell the computer to add some turbulence or, you know, some forces on it. Um, and then the pieces can break apart. You can have constraints between them so that when the constraint is present, then they can't, two pieces can't separate from each other. And then you can break those constraints at different times, maybe from the outside in, or maybe from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top or whatever. And then as soon as those constraints are broken, then the forces can come in and act on those pieces and the, the pieces fall apart and fly around or float around or however you want that environment to feel. But putting things together is a lot harder 
Um, and if you think about it, if you think about a an assembly process like this, those constraints, those those joining moments are happening on the fly, depending on how close one sort of unit, the monomer, gets to the assembly, the polymer. And that's not trivial to do in computer animation because you basically have to check for every single entity how close is it to every single other entity and what are the rules for if they're close enough to a certain thing, close enough to a point, and that point is not always the same. For example, if you look at this, you don't want anything joining to this point, but at the beginning of the animation, you did want something joining to that point. So you have to have some kind of rules, whether a, a unit is available to be joined to, and it's very complicated. So what a lot of people do in good ways or not so subtle ways or successful or unsuccessful ways, a lot of the time people simulate something breaking down and then reverse that footage essentially. And I've done that, that in the past and I've done that in this animation um, and I'll flag that up when we get there. So what that does for you is it's exactly the same as disassembly. I mean, one of the examples of disassembly here, break it down. No, so, not, not so these constraints are coming apart and the atoms are falling down. In this case, we have gravity, so it's very directional. If there was gravity, it would look unnatural, right? We're not used to things, you know, getting sucked up into the sky. So there's, there's lots of ways where it can look very unnatural. And so if you can do it in a way that you're simulating things forward, in my opinion, that's kind of the golden target goal. That's the ideal. This particular shot is animated simulated forwards it's proper things joining together small as they getting as they come into place together. okay so here we have a bunch of cubes and there's one sort of target and if any of the cubes that are floating around gets within the target range then this white line which is a constraint gets generated and sort of snaps it and keeps it all in one spot. So that was an early test for dynamic constraints that are, that are you know, being generated on the fly so that things get stuck together over time instead of breaking apart over time. Um, and then this was my second test. So this was not having one uh, goal or one target that things can bind to, but on each successive step, updating which target can be you know locked on to so you end up with a linear chain with some flexibility in the constraints as well so the the rules here are when a cube gets close enough to the end point then snap it on and update which is the end point and carry on forward like that so that's essentially what's happening uh here um except that again this isn't just a linear thing. It, ultimately it's lin linear, but I wanted to sort of subvert your expectations a little bit and like they clump together, but actually it's not just a random clump. It's a very specific chain. And so basically I had to keep track of every point that was available, how many points had bound to it, which ones were available, which bind together. And there's a little bit of a jump. A, a little bit of the jump is for a couple of reasons. One, to make it a little bit snappier and punchier. Secondly, so that the simulation doesn't take forever to run. Because if you imagine a very, very narrow tolerance of where that monomer needs to be before it can bind, it's gonna end up in that place much less often. Whereas if you have a wider target, say like two units away from the target goal, then it can jump into place anywhere within that two unit radius um, and that's much more likely to happen. Amazing. An interesting feature of this assembly process is that it almost always makes So yeah, and then, they, then the constraints break and the forces are acting on all of the units aside from these ones. They sort of flag these ones as don't move and the rest of them are like, okay, you can get pushed away. Process, is that it almost always makes linear change. So there's a lot going on in here. And other times there's several different kinds joined together. So this is exactly the same process, except what I'm doing here is not only is it checking if the unit is close enough to where it's gonna bind to, but it also has to be the same type. So I have a, an identifier for each different type 
and if that type is in or close enough to where it needs to be then it will snap into place here the exact sequence of units is going to be super important these ones are, even though it can look random so you can see here this this blue unit is snapping into place. That's how close it had to get. Um, and I spent a lot of time doing various different simulations, balancing the density of units, the speed that they're moving, uh, how close they needed to get so that the whole length of the chain growing matched up with the narration that I wanted to say on top of it. Because if I say what I need to say and then wait for 10 seconds while this thing finishes you know, the visuals, that's no good. So that's one of the tricky things about doing simulations and timing simulations to narration is you're kind of working within like, okay, I got like four seconds for this shot. What does that mean? And so you might notice that there's a lot more of these units than in the previous shot. The more units there are, the more likely um, one of the correct type is gonna jump into place. So yeah. Here the exact also skip ahead a little bit. Illustration classes of bit unusual. We'll see why. They are proteins and lipids, like fat. Big part of nutrition. We have a little bit of a lull in the visual uh, interest in this part of the animation, but I'm hoping that not too many people get bored and fall off at this point. Because there's lots of good stuff to come. Nutrition. Um, but here we can just proteins, jump ahead. Like all proteins. proteins use monomers linked together. Kinds, not five. Mm. Here they are the ingredients list, if you will. One of the things that I found was interesting when I was setting up this, this image is that it really hit home the utility of 2D chemical drawings. There's a temptation to think that a 3D model provides more information than a 2D drawing. And in a lot of cases, that's true. You can explore the 3D model by you know, moving around it and you can see the dimensionality of it and the contours of it, whatever. But in this case, when you have amino acids, there's no one single viewpoint that gives you the whole structure with the clarity that a 2D drawing does. Also, they're a lot easier to produce, et cetera, et cetera. I still think this is a cool way of seeing all the amino acids, but it's not like the most clear if you wanted to actually figure out how all of the atoms are arranged. These monomers are called amino acids. You've got a bunch of each of these floating around inside you. And if we start assembling, I'll let you guess how I made that shot. Well, just wait and see. So let's start with one of these and then one of these and stick it on and one of these and Hey, what's going on? Okay, so this one is another assembly process. And in this case, <laughs> there's a lot going on because I want this 2D character that I'm gonna draw after the fact to be grabbing amino acids out of the air and sticking it on to the full peptide chain at specific times, right? I have narration that's going along with this specifically. So in this case, what I opted to do is figure out when I want each of those amino acids to be put on uh, the chain, reverse that timing, and break down the full polypeptide chain so that this, this is one of the examples of something actually going backwards. So if we play this backwards, Yeah, so what's happening here is each unit gets separated and then floats away. And so I, re I create that simulation where those constraints are getting broken. And here's a, a quick little shot of that, one other test of the, the peptide breaking down. So this isn't exactly the, the simulation that ends up getting reversed into the final thing but you can see like these blue spheres represent each amino acid and they kind of just get separated um, and fall apart. Yeah, so I simulated it, reversed the footage, and so then my stick guy could assemble with the proper timing. Not only that, I had to offset the position of the chain from the free amino acid because he kind of grabs it out of the air. He doesn't grab it here, he grabs it here. Pew, pew. We're literally building a protein. Okay. And then the other thing I had to do was once, but let's keep going. We've got, once this simulation was created and reversed, 
then I have a water simulation, which just basically spits out one particle of water at each and binding point. So I kind of had to hand key the emitting properties there so that they get fired out in a semi-random direction, Literally. sort of at the camera, Literally building a protein. Uh, but they're all sort of spinning in different ways. Yeah, so it's kind of two different simulations stacked on top, one generated in reverse, one generated forward. Oh yeah, and then the background floaties are a separate simulation to kind of fill out the environment with amino acids. Hooray, our polymer is done. Yes, but it's not a protein yet. It's not? Amino acids have side chains sticking out here that can be sticky in different ways. Also, there's a lot of flexibility in the polymer chain. These two features mean- Yeah, protein folding. So the protein folding was something that I knew that I really wanted to do in this animation and I had no idea how I was going to do it. It's something that I was thinking about for months and months and months in the back of my head. I was like, I know I'm going to have to get to this shot. I know I'm going to have to have protein folding in some way. How am I going to do that? I knew the kind of representation I wanted to use. I wanted it to be ball and stick. I wanted it to fold up into known structures, not just like some random squiggles that look convincing, but actual structures so that later on I could have something produce an actual like antibody or something like that. And so I thought of many, many different ways of doing it. Proteins are actually folded up in complex and specific ways. It's this folded shape. So that looks like kind of a simulation, maybe like a wire or hair simulation. There's actually no simulation happening here. In the polymer. Um, and it's not hand animated either. I didn't go in and, and create all these twists and turns and flips and whatever by hand. It's all procedurally generated using complicated <laughs> mathematics. So I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but it's actually a very interesting story. I might sort of break it down and try to explain sort of the in interesting aspects of it because it was quite a process to, to make this happen. The short version is that after considering a whole bunch of different options, I came to the idea or the conclusion that I needed to take a crystal structure, a known protein structure, and flatten out all of the, basically unfold all of the bond rotations so that you end up with the linear chain that you have here. So this is the goal. Take that crystal structure and unfold it so your backbone is completely flat. And the way that I did that was I basically compared the positions of sequential atoms in the backbone, figured out their angles relative to each other and reversed that angle. And then to fold it back up for the animation, basically have a sliding window along that peptide chain and redo those angular rotations to put the bonds back into place these two features mean proteins are actually so here's one of the early tests that i did for this process is just looking at the backbones and getting those bond rotations happening in place so you can see it starts out flat and then those rotations start to go so this i think it's just it's all happening at once so this is kind of an early test and then here's a later test where it's the full structures that are getting twisted up. One of the big challenges, even though I got the sort of the mathematics and the twisting working properly, just in terms of composing the shots, one of the problems is that there's a lot of these big twirling sweeping motions as the, as those rotations start to get added. And it was really annoying to try to like frame those. I ended up doing a lot of like counter animation by hand. So like unrotating it as things rotated sort of globally to kind of get things into frame and look more natural and sort of locking which residue was sort of like the the center of mass, all of that sort of stuff. So there was, there was some extra work on top of that. These two features mean proteins are actually... And because in reality, proteins are constructed from the N-terminus to the C-terminus, that means that the N-terminus can start folding before the whole protein has been built. So what that means is that usually, 
uh, let's say in a globular protein, a, a protein that's kind of shaped like that, the end terminus is going to be in, in the inside or on one end of it so that the other parts, it can start folding up before the whole protein's done and you're not going to end up with like knots tied in it. If you unfold a protein, it's kind of uh, like you could grab both ends and pull, you wouldn't end up with knots in your final thing. So that worked in my favor because I could, you know, have those bonds rotating into place and I didn't have too many instances of the chain like folding through itself or like getting tangled up in itself. Um, it's this it ended up, ended up working pretty well. Some, you could have a folded shape that is good at making strong fibers for holding things together. I have a tutorial for making an actin filament um, on this channel as well if you're interested in giving that a try. That one's aimed at beginners to Houdini. If you've never tried Houdini, that's kind of a sort of an exploration of how Houdini works uh, and the ways that you can make cool things with it. Or a shape that is good at attaching to viruses. Or a shape that is good at breaking down other polymers into monomers. So you can see like as an example there, the C terminus, the end of it, just kind of like curls up into the, the end of it as, as opposed to like having to get inserted into the middle of the protein. My process following the same idea as the biology and then you end up with decent results that way. You see, when you eat protein, it is worth saying like that's not how proteins fold. That's not what protein folding actually would look like. I mean, for, for many reasons, but for the scope of this animation, I think it demonstrates the two main ideas that I wanted to have for proteins, which is that you have a linear sequence of amino acids and the specific sequence of amino acids and their inherent stickiness means that they twist and curl up into a very specific shape and that's essentially defines protein. In rich foods, you get not only energy, but also the I like the sound effect here. Build your own proteins. I think it was, I didn't make it myself. I got it from a library. It's like champagne fizzing or something like that, but I think it works. With 20. So that was another example of something breaking apart. That's a forward simulation, a lot easier to do than if those things got back together in that way. Different kinds of monomers. There are virtually unlimited possible sequences. You yourself can put together thousands upon thousands of different proteins. So even though I'm saying thousands upon thousands, I think I had about 20 different sequences that I just looped, but you can't tell because it's all blurred. Which sequences of monomers to use for the various proteins? Some foley with like playing cards or something, I think. parents taught you. You don't remember it because you were only about a tenth of a millimeter tall. So in this one, I was trying to replicate some kind of early zygote. I think there's like four cells no eight cells that are wrapped i don't know membrane i was trying to create something that looked vaguely biological i didn't spend a ton of time on that you one you arrived on the scene with a guidebook in the form of our next class of macromolecules the guidebook i mentioned is better known as dna a beautiful molecule that is made of two polymer strands. So I spent a lot of time on this DNA rig. DNA is something that's probably going to show up in a lot of different videos. And I wanted something that was pretty robust, something that you could create a curve and just automatically generate any length of DNA with any sequence that you want. So this is a specific sequence. It's not just random nucleotides and it automatically figures out what the pairing the needs to be to generate in one section of a DNA strand the complementary strand the amino acid sequence for a protein exactly how a DNA sequence maps to a protein sequence is an elegant story that I'd love to tell in future videos while proteins can be made of 20 different monomers a polymer of nucleic acid like usually the coloring that you have for the base pairs is usually like red green yellow blue um, that's pretty common but what I wanted to do was create a, a color schema that made it very obvious that they were four different colors four different monomers but the pairing is very obvious self-evident so i have this and these blue green and orange yellow and they feel naturally paired visually i think when you look at it in that way it's maybe not the most attractive color scheme but i think functionally it does the job so 
In other words, when we need another copy of DNA, the strands separate and another two strands. So yeah, I built this rig so that it wouldn't be too hard to have this sort of successive replications. So each of the strands, they're all the same, and I can just un unwind them, separate them, and then just figure out what the vertical offset needs to be and repopulate those nucleotides. molecules, proteins and nucleic acids. Next up, we have carbohydrates. The monomers for carbohydrates are hydrated Boom. carbon, like wet carbon. Hmm. This was kind of the one of the carbohydrate monomers sort of things that I remember learning in school. It's like in the form of carbon, carbon and carbohydrates are carbon and water. And if you look at the chemical formula for any carbohydrates, it's usually one so some atoms left. You know, proportion of carbon to one proportion of oxygen to two proportions of oxygen. Uh, hydrogen, like C6H12O6 for glucose. Plants um, are kind of so a it's big literally deal. carbon that's This small wet. molecule isn't the only kind of carbohydrate monomer, but it is the most important in a chemical formula glucose. sense. And that's why it's Plants called that. Plants make long chains of pure glucose, which is what we call starch. So do you want to guess on this one? Do you think this is one of the shots that I had? Let's watch it again. Is this a shot where I had the full structure and then broke it down sequentially and then reversed the simulation? Or is this a forward simulation where if the glucose monomer gets close enough to the end that it snaps on? I'll just play it and which you can look at it and see if you can guess. It's a polymer which uses just the one monomer. And it's also one of the rare examples of a branching structure. So this was one of the ones that I reversed. I simulated it breaking down and then I reversed it. And I think in particular you can tell like in here, it doesn't look, you can see them kind of also lining one of up. The rare examples of a branch. Right there. Sort of lining up to. And it's also one of the rare examples of a branch. To get into place. And that's where it looks a little weird and unnatural. But I think overall it and works pretty well. one of the rare examples of a branch. And, and so structure like this would take forever to simulate in the forward direction, if you think about it. With this density of starch, like either they would have to snap a long distance or they would have to be moving very quickly or they would have to just have tons and tons of them. Yeah. On monomer. And it's also one of the rare examples of a branching structure. So this, this amylose, amylopectin, I can't remember, there's two, there's two forms of a glucose polymer in starch. There's amylose and amylopectin. I think one of them is branched, one of them isn't. Now I'm forgetting everything that I did all the research on. And I think I did a pretty decent job of the structure here, but I think in reality, the reason you have these helical structures is because there's other strands of it, like the non-branched version kind of intertwines with it and creates like double helices of carbohydrates, which is pretty cool, but I couldn't go into that level of detail, I think. Um, so I wanted to, to give it as my best effort in terms of this kind of structure. I mean, you, you typically don't see starch represented like this. So I thought that was this, a neat opportunity to kind of show something cool. Um, but I think it is a, an incomplete representation as well. When you eat carbs in the form of starch, your body breaks... And so then this is basically the same to the simulation. Of glucose ...to get at the energy that was originally sold. But you'll notice a little interesting detail here. Well, there's a couple details that I'm proud of. One of them is that if you look carefully, so there's no water um, in this environment, but if you look at the like hydroxyl groups, as this one moves off, you get an extra OH here and an extra H there or vice versa um, so that the, the structures are correct. It's not just breaking off. You have those three atoms that get added Body breaks the for each time it gets broken off. And I did that all procedurally. So there's rules based on if it's a free glucose unit versus if it's a bound glucose unit versus if it's at the edge of the branch. Um, so speaking of the branch, I had to get it so that one of my early tests, let's see if I can find it. Right, so this is an early, early test of that amylopectin starch breakdown. And I wonder if it's, it's subtle. I don't know if you can see it here, but you can see that I'm breaking down each branch. But the problem here is that this strand gets broken down before this one finishes getting breaking down. So there's that sort of 
the base of this one is still intact before this one starts going. Yeah. So what I ended up doing in this one is I had to set a rule. You can see that here, these these units all break off polymers back down in by random chance, but then the, the breakdown has to stop here. Um, until the, this complete branch the monomers of glucose has been energy that was a has been broken down and then solar energy. this branch can continue breaking down which is more realistic otherwise you'd have these floating branches in space or the whole branch would break off and you'd have this chunk of branch um, and I'm pretty sure the amylase here uh, only works on those terminal units so again a little bit more a little, a little detail there that I tried to, to make was sure was accurate. I think we saw earlier is actually responsible for this process. I want to share one more. I'll skip ahead a little bit. Because of that, in watery environments, phospholipids tend to organize themselves into a double layer, letting the sticky heads stick to the water and keeping the tails tucked away. What happens at the edges? Well, there are. So the, the voice acting for the stick man, this is something that I've kind of gone back and forth on and I'm not totally decided. So in the earlier videos I've had, I've just voiced the stick man character myself or in the, in the first video, I don't think the stick man said anything. That was the, the pinball machine of science. And then in the next video, I thought, you know, this is actually a good feature is a wrong word, but it's a nice thing to have another character to kind of bounce question, sort of like a Socratic method, bouncing question and answer off of. So the stickman can ask, ask a question, I can answer the question, or, or I can ask a question and the stickman can think about it or puzzle and ponder like the audience. So it's kind of a proxy for speaking to the audience in some ways. And so I just voiced it myself because I just had myself to, to make these. And partly that's also because that's kind of how I think and process things is I ask myself questions and I answer myself and I have these debates with myself in my head. Um, yes. So that's kind of just the verbalization of that kind of thought process. The way that I write a script is just like question and answer. Why is this with the way it is? But maybe that's a little bit confusing for the audience because the voice doesn't change when the stick man is supposed to be talking or whether it's me supposed to be talking and sometimes it's kind of ambiguous who has this idea. And, so, and that's sometimes that's something that I don't really have the answer to. There are some parts of this video where I'm like, is this something that the stick person should be saying or is it? me as the narrator. So then I thought, well, I could do a voice, but I'm, I don't know. I'm not really very good at doing voices. And I also thought I could process it, like pitch shift it in the audio editing. And that sounded, it didn't work. I don't know. Maybe there's something there, but I was just like, nah, it didn't work. So then my wife suggested, you know, why don't, why don't you try our son to, to say some of the lines? And I, I gave it a try and I was like, yeah, I think, I think it works. I think it's, it's this this sort of innocent, curious character, which which is how he's kind of voicing it. And so I, I really would be happy to hear what your thoughts are. I won't be offended or on his behalf if you're like, ah, eh, it doesn't really work. I know that working with kids, sometimes it doesn't fit the emotional quality that you had in your head. So I don't know, it's still something that I'm experimenting with. And I'm not too worried about it being consistent from video to video. I think there's natural evolution in a channel as more videos get published. And I, I think I would be doing myself a disservice if I just stuck with the first version of everything that I came up with so that there was consistency taking precedence over something that was actually an improvement. So I'm happy to evolve as we go. There aren't really any edges. These double walled collections of molecules form complete hollow sacs. And I knew that I wanted to have this lipid membrane being created like this. I wasn't sure how it would look, whether it would be too visually confusing, what was going on, but I'm really kind of happy with how it rendered out with that internal shadow and the edges coming around. I think it, I think it works. So you can appreciate the three dimensionality of the, the object, at least I hope so, with a little bit of depth of field that makes it work as well. So I was pretty pleased with how that kind of effect came out. Sometimes you have an idea for an effect in your head and you're like, oh, it's gonna be so awesome. And then you create it and you render it or you give it a try and you're like, ah, it just doesn't have the wow factor or visual clarity or explanatory power that you were expecting it to have. But that's part of the process. 
hollow sacks, doesn't anything go inside them? And then magically, the Any cell number. gets filled with stuff. Now filling this thing, things. Here, let's put if some color on it. Right collection of macromolecules and small molecules inside. Cell packing is the whole thing. Um, there's a tool out there called cell pack. And the idea of cell pack is that you have a bunch of molecular species of different kinds of molecules and you have a volume and you say, okay, here's a recipe for things, stick it in the volume and there you go. And it does clever algorithmic checking for intersections and all of these sorts of different things to, to pack that space efficiently and fully. I tried to go there and there were some technical hurdles and I was like, you know, I could probably do this sort of stepwise on my own. So what I did was I took the DNA as a curve and just created sort of a, a coarse outline of it. Actually a fairly tight outline. I knew that I couldn't just have like, if you're familiar with like convex shells around things. So like imagine you're like taking a wrap around an object or a wrapper and that's like the volume that it occupies but things like dna and this this carbohydrate they've all got sorts of ins and outs that need to be filled with the water and the small molecules so i had to do this really careful meshing to check whether things were intersecting with each other and so that it would fill up the proper volume. In any case, I ended up doing like, I placed all of the big, the macromolecules by hand. And then I just said, scatter some points in the remaining volume and put small molecules on those and then do a rigid body simulation to resolve any intersections and collisions and overlaps that there were in the scattering process to kind of fill in the gaps and, and make sure these things are kind of appropriately spaced. It turns out that there's well over a million atoms in this scene, but it's still like nothing on a real cell, even the tiniest and tiniest of uh, single celled organisms. Nature's amazing. This lipid bag defines a unit of biology that we call a cell. And we're gonna dive in. Nope, we're pulling out, okay. Four categories of macromolecules that you eat break down and rebuild. I feel like this is the cornerstone of the video. Like this is this is the crux of the video. This is like, you've got different kinds of macromolecules and you eat them and then you break them down and then you build them into macromolecules that you need. And so that's like, if I, if I want somebody to take anything away from the video, I think maybe that would be one of the things. To perform tasks, store energy, construct cells, and basically let you grow and survive and then pass on the instructions to let the next generation do all of that too. Thank you so How much. How much protein and carbs does lettuce actually have? <clears throat> and here's okay. me on a green screen. Nutritionally, it's not a crazy amount. You'd need to eat at least 10 kilograms of lettuce to meet your energy requirement. I was very self-conscious about all these calculations. I kept like, yeah, is this right? Is this, am I doing this right? Because the reality is there's a massive range of, well, nutritional requirements and also kinds of lettuce and also how big is that piece of lettuce for Every when I'm actually calculating day. the molecules. But Every single so, cell. Yeah. Okay, so this shot, this shot looks pretty simple. In fact, maybe some people maybe thought it was like an actual micrograph. No, it's all CG. And to create it was pretty complicated process to get something that I was reasonably happy with. I have on my Patreon, this is a plug for my Patreon, so you can skip this bit if you really don't care about that. But given that you've made it this far, it's possible that you actually are interested in like the nitty gritty of these behind the scenes things. So on my Patreon at the cell tier and above, you have access to a deep dive for each video where I go into excruciating, no, amazing detail about how I made a single shot and uh, from the video. And so this was, this was the shot that I chose. Um, and there's some interesting details about my thought process and plant morphology and, and how I ended up creating these effects. So if you're interested in that, go check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash biocinematics. Thank you. Tillion protein. And so if you do some math here, I'm saying 300 quintillion. Obviously that's like not an exact number at all. Like I said, like there's a huge amount of it. How big is that leaf? How much protein content is in different kinds of lettuce? I was looking at like the nutrition facts, everything. But if you do the math here, this 9 billion protein molecules, that doesn't even show up in the final answer. 
150 million times 2 trillion is 300 quintillion. The 9 billion doesn't even show up because if you add it, it's like three orders of magnitude smaller than any of these other numbers. And I only have one significant digit. Also, this carbohydrate molecules includes free glucose. And I felt that was important because glucose is a carbohydrate. If you drink glucose syrup, you're consuming carbohydrates, right? Like there's nothing else that it could be. Virtually all of this two trillion is not the cellulose in the cell wall. It's the free glu glucose that's inside a lettuce cell. So is that a fair thing to say? Like I didn't include amino acids because I don't... Actually, you know what? This probably... Bottom line, don't take this calculation too seriously. The only point that I was trying to make is that's a big number. At a molecular scale, there's a lot of this going on in a single leaf. So yeah, even though nutritionally lettuce doesn't have tons of protein, molecularly, it's mind boggling. Carbohydrate molecules in this single leaf. That is a lot. That is a lot. Thank you so much for watching. I want to say and then I plug, plug, eats a lot. talk about this. And you don't actually, make, you know, so a lot of people have commented, oh, this channel's really underrated. I like this one comment. I just started crying after seeing your subs and views. Think, think about how I feel. Yeah. Obviously, I wish that I had more subscribers and more views, but I think that one of the big reasons that the channel is growing relatively slowly is because I'm not putting out a video every week. I'm not even putting out a video every month. So when you only have two or one or three videos coming out in a single year, it's not unreasonable to expect relatively slow growth. Like, I really feel like I need to make each video count and put the best quality that I can into it. But on the other hand, I also need to make sure that I'm keeping my scope fairly limited, not like the giant scope of this video, so that I actually can start to have a relative consistent schedule. But then I also have to balance that with other work demands. I'm doing client work and freelance work to actually have in income. Eventually, I would love to have this YouTube be self-sustaining and provide an income for, for me and my family, but I'm okay with, I'm okay with the, gro like the growth makes sense to me. So even though I would love millions of subscribers, I'm not like, why is this not happening to me? I don't understand it. You know, it, it makes sense with the upload schedule and the relatively niche subject matter. Although I, I do try to make things accessible to broad audiences. Anyways. And you might share this video with someone who eats a lot of lettuce. Please share so the videos. This as a pro Did that look like a natural drop? That was totally staged. I don't know. So people talk about this as... So I wanted to leave the viewer with a little question to wrap things up. Uh, and speaking of wrapping things up, thank you for joining me for this creator's commentary. I enjoyed talking about... I really love talking about the process of this. If you see like the, the amount of content that I'm trying to at least put on this Making Biocinematics channel, it is something I'm passionate about alongside being passionate about creating biology and science animation to educate people and inspire people. I care about teaching the computer stuff too. It's a lot of fun. So thanks. Consider subscribing if you're not already. Consider sharing this if you want me to make more of this kind of thing. Thanks so much for watching and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Take care.